Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Um, my name is Akbar and I am uh, from the Department of Economics, Faculty of Economics and Business Untas Gajah Mada, and I will be hosting this session. Um, this session will last for about two hours, uh, from uh, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., and we will be together. Uh, following uh, the presentation by our keynote speaker, Dr. Sami Al Swailem, um, who is the Director General of the Islamic Research and Training Institute, uh, Jeddah. Um, so, in general, our session will go like uh, will uh, will start with presentation, and after that, if it is possible, then perhaps you are lucky enough to have a question and answer session with Dr. Sami Al Swailem, if possible. Okay, uh, let's move to our main uh, session, um, which is a keynote speech by our uh, keynote speaker, His Excellency Dr. Sami Al Swailem. Um, Assalamualaikum, Dr. Sami Al Swailem. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, I wish you a good uh, uh, health, uh, uh, happiness um, uh, from Zida. <laughs> Um, okay, um, I think uh, I will pass uh, over the forum as soon as possible to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sami Al Swailam, as you if you are uh, already there. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Swailam, the time is yours. Thank you very much, and um, thanks to the organizers of the I Week. I'm very honored to be uh, part of this uh, festival and this very important uh, event in Indonesia. Uh, I have been participating in various uh, events uh, in Jakarta in the past. It used to be in person, and I had the honor to meet many very good colleagues. Uh, now we are doing it virtual, but uh, Alhamdulillah, this would bring will always bring us together, no matter what the conditions are. Uh, today, I'll be talking about Islamic economics in a complex world. If you allow me, I will share the screen for my slides. Yes, please. Very good. So uh, this title, Islamic Economics in a Complex World, is actually the title of uh, a small uh, book that we prepared in IRTI, an Islamic Research and Training Institute, in 2008, published 2008. <clears throat> it was an attempt to explore what does complexity mean and how to uh, address issues related to complexity. And we used agent-based simulation tools to simulate uh, an economy with Islamic finance compared with interest-based finance. And the results were quite interesting. And I invite you to visit the website of the uh, Institute. Now it's called Islamic Development Bank Institute uh, to get or to see or to uh, take a look at the full study with all the results. Today, I will not, of course, review the, uh, the study that was done how long ago, 12 years ago. But instead, we will try to move to uh, research that uh, took place afterwards. So we will have a very brief discussion <clears throat> on the nature of complexity and the uh, very important topic of the incompletability of markets, and then look at market paradoxes that arise from this in incompleteness of the markets. And then we conclude by the role of Islamic economics in such a complex world. Now, the best way to, to, to know what is the nature of complexity is through a very important event that many of you uh, are aware of. Maybe some of you are too young to, uh, to uh, live the, the crisis in 2008. But here's what happened. On 5th of November 2008, Queen Elizabeth was visiting London School of Economics and she asked the economists there, why did no one see this credit crunch, this global crisis, this disaster coming? All these brains, all these sophisticated models, 
all these uh, uh, advanced uh, techniques, advanced computer systems, and so on and so forth, all these sophisticated and complicated mathematical models, why it did not warn everybody about this huge and disastrous crash in the financial market worldwide. It was the worst financial crisis in history. So this is a very innocent and very simple question. So the economists convened uh, uh, several meetings and here's the summary. You can find this obviously on the internet. You can just ask, type in Google, Queen and London School of Economics 2008, you would get all the details. But you can also visit the uh, British Academy website. You can see, you can find it there. So the reports that the economists prepared and submitted to the Queen summarizes by the following. The failure to foresee the timing, extent, and severity of the crisis was principally a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country, which is the UK and internationally, to understand the risk to the system as a whole. So even though these financial institutions, traders, speculators everywhere, they were very bright, they were using very sophisticated uh, models, and very advanced computing systems, but each was looking at one part of the system. None of the players looked at the system as a whole. And this caused the crash. Okay. And that is the heart of complexity. That's a complex system. A complex system is a system where the whole is different from the parts. If you focus on the parts, you cannot get the big picture. You have to balance the part and the whole. Otherwise, it will not, uh, you, you will fail to see the whole picture. And then such crises will, will be imminent. This is called fallacy of composition. Fallacy of composition is to assume that what is true for the part is true for the whole system. But that's not true. This is the fallacy of composition. That's what means, that's what a complex system or a, a, a complex world. It's a world where you cannot figure out the, the whole by simply focusing on the parts. And this, in, in, in economics in particular, this means self-interest and group interests will diverge. When we talk about the economy, talk about the economy as a whole, it means we are talking about the society as a whole. And therefore, what is good for the community or the society as a whole will be what is the best for the individual in that economy or in that society. So self-interest and group interest will diverge. Not always, but frequently. Frequently, group interests and self-interests, group, <coughs> group rationality self and individual rationality, they will diverge. They do not match. Mainstream economics, new classical economics, it assumes now that focus on the individual, self-interest will be enough to achieve group interest. That's the invisible hand, right? That's the invisible hand that if each one, if each member of the society just focuses on his own uh, advantages, that would be enough that the whole society will be better off. There might be some exceptions here and there, but these exceptions are exceptions, they are rare. The most of the time, usually, they fit self-interest and group interest from new classical point of view. They always coincide or most of the time they coincide. But that's not the case in a complex world. In a complex world, the whole and the parts frequently and usually diverge. Not always, but most of the time or very frequently 
that you cannot say this is an exception. No, this is the norm rather than the exception. And if you read carefully all the crises, disasters, from the Great Depression to the global financial crisis to the uh, pending climate crisis, all of these crises are crises emanating from the divergence between the group interest and self-interest. So to understand the world around us, we have to realize that the world is complex, which means looking at the parts will not be enough to see the whole picture. Maximizing individual profits will not maximize the welfare of the society. These are two different things. Next, we move to some, uh, an important topic that would uh, give support, logical support and mathematical support to the complexity of the world. Now, what does incompleteness mean? We will get into that, but in general, if the whole is different from the part, that means trying to describe the parts will not be enough. So the description of the part will be always incomplete. Why? Because there will be uh, aggregate or systemic aspects that the description of the parts will fail to recognize. So the, the relation, this is the overall relationship between complexity and, and incompleteness. Now, Kurt Gödel is one of the most famous uh, or best uh, logicians, mathematical and mathematicians, uh, probably for sure in the 20th century. And for some, he is probably one of the best uh, logicians uh, in history. And he published when he was only 25 years old, he published a paper, his famous incompleteness theorem in 1931. <clears throat> and this theorem has basically two parts. The first part says a formal system, which is basically a model, a formal system rich in arithmetics. You, have just, you just need to have plus and minus and multiplication and division. So you have to have the basic arithmetic uh, operations included in that model. So a formal system rich in arithmetic can be either consistent or complete, but not both. Consistent means has no contradiction, okay? So obviously no one wants contradiction, right? Because contradiction is some, that means whatever you say is just meaningless. Complete means all the truth, all true statement can be proved. You have a proof for every true statement. Every true statement can, can be proved and every proof provides a true statement. So truth and proof, they are one. Uh, that's, that, that's, the, that's the logic before Gödel. Before Gödel, that was the idea that proof should always bring us to truth. If, you, if, if it's something true, you can prove it. So what, what Gödel said is that that is not necessarily the case. If, if a system is complete, it will, not be con uh, it will not be consistent. So if you can prove every true statement, then you must fall into contradiction, which means it cannot, you cannot get true statements out of it. Now, the second theorem or the second part of, of Gödel's theorem is that the consistency of the system cannot be proved within the system. You cannot, within the model, prove or assume that the model is, is logically consistent. You can do this only from outside the model. We will see, we'll get to this, inshallah, now. So, so this, is, this is the first part of the theorem. Basically, what it says, that the set of truth or true statements is larger than the set of proof. So you can prove true statements, but you cannot prove all true statements. There will be true statements that we cannot prove. There will be infinite, actually, infinity of true statements that are beyond the reach of proof. So truth is, is a larger set, much larger than the set of proof. 
that doesn't mean proof is useless. No. Proof is good. It provides you us with truth, it, it, the tools to reach truth, but only a small part of the truth. So we can only prove a small set of the truth. There is a very large set of true statements that we cannot actually prove. Now, to translate this into uh, economics, so a formal system basically is a model, okay? And as you all know, economists, they like models, dynamics, stochastic, general equilibrium, and so on and so forth, right? So that's lucky for economics because you don't have to explain what is a formal system. It's a very complicated thing, you think, a formal system. But simply to think of an economic model, you have axioms and then you derive results or, or theorems from this model. That would be anyone who studied in graduate school and studied microeconomics and these things is familiar with these things. Now, what is truth from economic point of view? What, what is the ultimate truth that we are looking for? Well, economists, they are, the ultimate truth for economists is efficiency, which means all resources have been utilized. There is no idle uh, resource sitting there doing nothing. Okay, there's no money on the table. Money has been distributed. So the, the ultimate truth that we are looking for, the ultimate objective of, of economic analysis, at least modern economic analysis, is efficiency, which is uh, utilizing resources to the maximum. No, no resource is sitting idle. Okay, so this is what we are looking for, okay? And how are we getting to it? Market mechanism. Economists think that the market mechanism, competition, self-interest, individual rationality, all these things that comprise the market mechanism is the way to reach efficiency. This is, you know, the, uh, the, the pre-optimality of the market. Market will, will, will utilize resources and make uh, optimal allocation of resources. Just like proof is a, is a means to reach the truth, from economic point of view, the market mechanism is a way to reach efficiency, efficient allocation of resources or Pareto optimality, you have heard about this. Now, if we apply Gödel's theorem to economic reasoning, what does that mean? It means there will be Pareto improving opportunities that can be realized only through non-market arrangements. That's what it means. So remember in the previous uh, uh, figure that we have truth, the set of truth, the larger set, and then we have in the center, we have the proof. Here we have the market mechanism and we have efficient allocation of resources. So this larger set is the set of all efficient allocations. Now, the what Gödel's theorem say, if we apply Gödel's theorem to the economy, it says markets will not be able to achieve all efficient allocations. It will be able to achieve some efficient allocations, but it will not be able to achieve all. There will be many, many situations, many cases in which there is an opportunity to improve resource allocation. There is an opportunity to, to have a Pareto optimal outcome. And yet the market mechanism, the self-interest or, or competitive strategy will not work. It will not get us to there. And like what? I mean, you can, you can ask like what? I mean, have, have we heard about this before? Is this something that we are familiar with? And the answer is yes. We are all familiar with prisoner's dilemma game. And what is a prisoner's dilemma game? It's the a situation where mutual cooperation is not achievable by individual rationality. So, so let's see, first of all, how does the game look like? I'm sure many of you have read or heard about it. So let me remind you. So we have two individuals, we call them players. By the way, this is not a pure game. It's game theory is now part of economics. So using the word game should not put you off, okay? 
So we have two parties or two individuals or two players. For each player, we have two strategies, either to cooperate or not to cooperate, to defect. Now, if the two players cooperate, okay, each player will get seven. So the first number seven is for player A, the second number is for player B. So A will get seven, B will get seven. Now, look at this carefully. If player B decides to cooperate, then player A would say, look, if I defect instead of cooperate, how much would I get? How much do I get? I will get A, right? Why? Because this is my payoff. This is player A payoff. So as long as player A is cooperating, this means, play, sorry, as long as player B is cooperating, this means player A can switch from cooperate to defect and therefore improve his payoff from seven to eight. But if player A did that, if player A decide to defect, what would player B do? Player B would say, hey, if, if A defects, I will get four instead of seven. That's player B is reasoning. So player B would say, hey, I would be better off to switch to defect because in this case, I will get five instead of four. So if each player thinks of his own self-interest, the dominant strategy would be defect and defect. So player A will choose defect, player B will choose defect. That would be the dominant strategy outcome, which is five and five. But which, which uh, outcome is better, five and five or seven and seven? Obviously, seven and seven, cooperate, mutual cooperation, Pareto dominates mutual defect. This outcome is strictly better. The two, each player strictly prefers this outcome to this outcome. And yet, if they follow self-interest, they reach only five and five. Now, if you notice, the mutual cooperation strictly dominates mutual defection, but mutual cooperation does not uh, parry to dominate defect on one part on or by one player while cooperating by the other or vice versa. So this outcome does not parry to dominate this one. Why? Because although eight is better than seven, four is less than seven. So this outcome does not parry to dominate this one. Same thing here. But for this outcome, yes, this outcome is dominated by mutual cooperation. So you can see, and if each player thinks only of his own interest, he would say, I am better off to defect because if pl player, B, player A would say, I am better off to defect because if B is cooperating, I'll get eight instead of seven. If B is defecting, I'll get five instead of four. Therefore, I am better off always to defect. That's the dominant strategy. Same thing for player B. Player B would say, I am better off uh, to defect because if A is cooperating, I will get eight instead of seven. And if A is defecting, I will get five instead of four. Therefore, the dominant strategy for me is to defect. If each party defects, they get five and five, which is inferior, Pareto inferior to mutual cooperation. So this is a very clear example of how market mechanism, self-interest, dominant strategy fails to achieve Pareto optimality. Okay, that's a, that's a very good example of incompleteness at work. That incomplete means we are unable to reach this Pareto optimal outcome using the dominant, dominant strategy or competitive strategy or self-interest 
will not bring us to the Pareto optimal outcome. Now, one could say, so, for, so from, from, from a um, uh, logical point of view, it's not solvable. That's what, let's say, they say not, that, what does it mean to say it's incomplete? It means using the dominant strategy approach, we are unable to reach the Pareto optimal outcome. And that, that's what the problem is, or the present dilemma game is unsolvable. So you can see here that the Pareto optimality, that the dominant strategy fails to achieve Pareto optimality in some case. In some cases it does, in some others it doesn't. So Pareto optimality extends beyond dominant strategy, beyond competitive strategy. Competition will not always bring us Pareto optimality. Okay. Now, one could say, and how many cases like these prison dilemma games? I haven't seen anyone in the street playing this prisoner's dilemma game. Now, guess what? Almost all economic problems that we are facing are actually prison dilemma games, or more generally, they call it social dilemmas. So what good is theorem, if we apply it to the, the, the economic uh, domain, it says that these kinds of dilemmas are, are ubiquitous, are everywhere. It is not something, uh, the exception. No, it's not exceptional. They are the norm. And number two, that these problems are unsolvable. And unsolvable means no matter how smart we are in designing regulation, creating new markets, creating new derivatives, new formulas, new mathematical uh, 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 models, no matter how smart we are, these dilemmas will always be there. This is a logical result, which means it is, it is part of our uh, reasoning, right? We, are, we will never be able to overcome this problem. This problem is, is at the heart of reason, of logic, and it will not be possible to overcome this by the means of reason. So we, we can overcome it using other aspects like social uh, arrangements, like cooperation, but we cannot uh, overcome this using logical means. And the most famous example for these social dynamics is tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of the commons, if, if people living in a place, let's say on an island in, in, in the middle of the ocean, and they have a limited supply of, of, uh, of, of uh, drinking water, okay? Water that can, they can use for drinking and cooking and so on. So if, they, if each one try to get more than the others, they overexploit the resources, then they, they suck more water out of the ground and they end up uh, in, in a worse situation. Uh, oil producing countries, if they, if they try to compete with, with each other to produce more and therefore to sell more of oil, they will end up with a disaster that they are depleting the resources and also to crash the, the, the market and they will end up with a, a worse scenario for everyone. The global climate crisis is the, the mother of all, tragedy, of all tragedies, okay? Why? Because if now these countries, they try to come together and say, hey, we have to reduce the emission of carbon dioxide. Okay, so, so China would say to America, okay, you, you cut your, your, your uh, carbon dioxide production. If the US tries to cut down the, the production, that means they have to put pressure on businesses and corporate while China is not doing that, that means China will be able to produce more goods and services in the short run and sell more goods and services and therefore uh, overtake the US in, in trade and, and business. See, so they, we have, all countries have to come together and agree to cut the emission of carbon dioxide or otherwise some would say, okay, you cut your own emission I'll be just doing business as usual and therefore I'll be able to make more money in the short run 
even though in the medium run, now we are all paying the price. So that's the, the problem of, of global climate crisis is a classical example of the tragedy of the commons, which is uh, the most important application of social dilemmas or prisoner's dilemma game. So this is not something uh, in theory. This is, uh, this is something that we see on daily basis. The most, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, most of the crises throughout history are actually social dynamics. So if you understand social dynamics, if you understand present dilemma game, you, you understand the whole uh, lot of, of economic history and what to do about it. All public goods are actually uh, 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 social, are subject to social dilemmas. The market itself is a public good. You cannot create a market by going to the market, right? I mean, this will be uh, logically inconceivable, right? You, can, you have to create the market in the beginning. If there is no market, you have to create the market. That means this decision to create the market is a non-market decision because how could you create the market uh, unless by resorting to non-market means? Otherwise, you can, every market needs a market, every market needs a market, and then you, you end up with nothing. So the market itself is a public good, which means everyone have to agree on the rules of the market, the, 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 the position of the market, the uh, regulations of them and so on and so forth. These rules and regulations are collective decisions in order to have the market functioning and normally uh, in a normal manner. Stability is a public good also. And I will not, uh, and that's the global financial crisis is a very good example of how when each individual bank was looking only at the risks if the bank is facing, then we end up with the crisis. That's just like, you know, we are all in the same boat, right? That's the hadith that uh, the society is just like people traveling in a boat or in a ship. You cannot say, I will cut from my part of the ship in order to get supplies, in order to save the hassle of going to the top of the ship and talking to others and so on. Anyone... <coughs> Anyone inflicting the ship will be inflicting everyone else. You cannot say this is my part of the ship, not your part. You, you don't have to worry about my part. You worry about your part. No. Within, so only for a limited range, this can work. But in principle, it doesn't work. We are all in the same boat. So the stability and safety of the boat is the responsibility of everyone. Now we come to the COVID crisis where healthcare, healthcare is a public good which means we are, all of us must work together in order to overcome the pandemic and, 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 and cure or, or uh, you know, find a way to, to fight the disease. You can have a very simple example of how this can be modeled as a present dilemma game. Let's say companies and entities, they have two choices, either to invest, to spend money on healthcare, on public uh, hospitals, public vaccines, R&D, all these aspects are public. You have to spend and you do not expect money come directly coming out of this public hospital or out of R&D uh, to develop vaccines and so on. These are more or less spending to the, uh, to the benefit of the society as a whole. So if you, have, if you can think that we have two groups of, of companies, and they have this decision either to spend on healthcare, part of the, of the resources, not all the resources, of course, part of the resources uh, of the company would be spent on healthcare of the society, or simply use all your resources in marketing. So each group of companies, or let's say two companies, okay, it's, it's not, a, I mean, it works both ways. They have two choices, either to allocate some of their resources for public health care, public R&D, vaccine development to help everyone, or to use all resources for marketing and therefore generating profits. 
Now, if all, if the two companies cooperate or the two groups of companies cooperate, they can achieve this kind of, let's say, payoff, let's say four and four. Now, if group B is spending on healthcare, then group A would say, hey, why I'm, I'm spending on healthcare? The other group, they are spending on healthcare. So I'll use all my resources for marketing and therefore generating profits and therefore I will beat group B. I will make more profits than group B. That's what group A might think. So if they decide to do this, they will get more profits, that's true. But then group B, they realize they are uh, at the worst of both worlds. They are not uh, maximizing their profits and they are spending on healthcare and what they spend is not enough really to fight the pandemic because all the two, the two groups, they have to come together to fight the pandemic. One group alone will not be able to do that. So if one group deviates or defects, that group will make more uh, returns in the short run, but the other group will find that it is losing, in which case they say, why should we spend on healthcare? Let's spend on marketing because minus one is is, uh, is bigger than, in, uh, than minus two, as you know. Therefore, group B will be better off to switch to minus one, to, to marketing, using all their resources for marketing instead of uh, spending on healthcare. And what will be the result? If all companies or both groups are spending their resources on marketing and nothing on healthcare, the result will be Defect, defect, that means minus one, minus one, which is Pareto inferior to four and four. Okay, so, so the COVID dilemma is, is one, just one example of hundreds of, and thousands of examples of present dilemma games. Everywhere, this is the normal situation in the economy. Unfortunately, our textbook economics doesn't address this they call it externalities. See, in, in economy, they call it externalities. These externalities are put at the end of the book, right? It's, if you look at any graduate textbook in microeconomics, externalities is at, at the end. And you spend, if you, have, if you have study any of these, most of the time, there will be not enough uh, time to, to reach uh, the externalities chapter. So they will ignore the externality chapter. Most of the class will be about, or the semester will be about uh, maximizing profits, maximizing utilities, partial equilibrium, general equilibrium, and so on and so forth. All this is based on the assumption that externalities or public goods are exceptional things, when actually it's the other way around. These, uh, these dilemmas are the norm they are not the exception, they are the norm. Now, if we follow the reasoning of, of Goodell's theorem and uh, incompleteness of market, we get to the following. If we go back to, if, uh, to the president's dilemma, okay, and if each player thinks that I should follow dominant strategy, I don't care, I am, a good believer in dominant strategy. I studied game theory and they told me, you always follow the dominant strategy. So I will fo follow dominant strategy. And the dominant strategy in a present dilemma game is defect. If we do this, we end up with an inferior outcome. Okay, so why, sh why would a rational person follow the dominant strategy? Because the dominant strategy is supposed to reach Pareto optimal results. But in a prisoner's dilemma game, the dominant strategy will result in a Pareto inferior outcome. It's self-defeating. So if, we, if the players uh, have strong belief in, 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 dom in their rationality, they say, hey, I am a rational person, which means I always follow the dominant strategy. Then what would be the result? The result, if all players follow the same uh, reasoning, we end up with a Pareto inferior outcome, which is irrational because 
the rational strategy should produce optimal outcome. But what happens in a, in a present dilemma game is that the dominant strategy would result in an inferior outcome. So if we believe we are rational in the sense that we do not make any mistakes, dominant strategies will always bring us pretty to optimal outcome. If we believe we are rational, we end up being irrational. This is, this is one of the lessons that we learn from Gödel's theorem. You cannot prove or assume your own consistency. You cannot say, I do not make mistakes. I never fall in, into a, a contradiction. I am a logical person. I, I actually even a robot. So, so think of, of, of agents as robots. If any of those robots has part of its code, a statement that says, there is no bug whatsoever in this robot, this will create the bug. So this is something very important to, to understand. These uh, reason, you have to be humble. So this is, this is the, the message, okay? You have to be humble. You cannot say, I cannot make any contradiction. You cannot say this. You cannot assume it. If you want to avoid contradiction, you have to struggle to strive for that. You cannot assume it from the beginning. You cannot assume from the start that you do not make any contradiction. So this is the first paradox, the paradox of rationality. If agents think that they are rational, which means they think that they will never make any contradiction, which means uh, they believe that dominant strategies will always produce Pareto optimum outcomes. If that is the case, they end up with irrational outcomes, Pareto inferior outcomes. That's what happens in a present dynamic. Efficiency paradox. Now, efficiency in the, in the narrow sense, in market, they say markets are efficient, which means all information has been reflected in prices. That's another way to say that all resources have been utilized. So information is one, one of the important resources and uh, in a, an efficient market, all information has to be reflected in prices. So there is no lost information, okay? Now, information is scarce and costly and therefore in order to, to generate information, you have to spend. So information, but once you spend, and once you get the information, information becomes publicly available. It's a public good. You cannot control the information easily. Once the information is out, it is out. So information is a public good. Now, if agents think the market is efficient, that they, they, there is no need to invest in information. Why would you spend millions of dollars to find information, to generate information, when actually you think the market is already efficient, the market already has all the information needed, already reflected in the prices. So why would you spend money on information? If the market is efficient already, there is no need to spend money on information if the market is already efficient. But if people stop spending and investing in information, what will happen? The market will become inefficient because in order to generate information, you have to spend money. And if people say, we don't need to spend money on information, the market's already efficient, no more information will be coming and therefore the market will be inefficient because there is a lot of information that are hidden and we are unable to bring that, we have to spend money to extract that information. So just, just like healthcare, if we spend money on healthcare, everyone will be healthy. But if we assume everybody is healthy, nobody will be spending on healthcare and we end up with, with, with a disaster. So if agents believe the market is efficient, the market will become inefficient. This is very interesting, by the way, and you will not find this in mainstream economics, by the way. But this is a direct application of the Goodell's theorem. Now, some people would say, no, 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 Goodell's theorem is, is a is about logic that has nothing to do about economics. This is not true because all the models of economics are coming from mathematics. They are using 
pure math theorems that were developed uh, in, in pure math without any background in economics. And they are applying it in, in markets and, and in, 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 in the economy. So why not we apply the theorem of, of Gödel in, on the economy? And also Gödel himself, he thought that his theorems do apply to social problems. So Gödel himself, uh, Gödel himself he, he was aware, uh, he thought that his theorem could be applied to social problems. Now the paradox of risk, okay? Hyman Minsky is well known for this. He's, he used to say stability is destabilizing. If agents think the market is stable, then they should not be cautious. If every one of us think that we are safe, risk-free, no risk, what would happen? If there's no risk, people will be taking on additional risks, and this will make the system more risky. So that's exactly the paradox of risk. Low risk environment induces risk taking, and therefore stability is destabilizing. Now, can you, can you hear me? Yes, very no? clear. Yes, yes, very clear. clear. Yes. Okay, 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 very good. Very good. So, so but by the way, Jaime Minsky, as far as we know, he did not uh, use Gödel theorem for his uh, uh, financial instability hypothesis. This is this hypothesis of Hyman Minsky is called financial instability hypothesis, which says that when firms think that the market is stable, they will be loading risk, and therefore the market will become risky, and therefore it will be uh, 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 you know threatening the stability of the system. He did not use Gödel's theorem. But you can see that how Gudustin applied directly. Gudustin says, if you believe you are consistent, you will become inconsistent. That's, that's the second part of Gudustin. If we think we are rational, we become irrational. If we think the market is efficient, it will become inefficient. And if we think the market is stable, the market will be actually unstable. And to, to put it back again into the uh, present dilemma game terminology, stability is a public good. We have to share the risks. Sharing, if, if you, we can, we can, I should have put this into a, a, a present dilemma game table. You can have, okay, this is an exercise, okay? This is for a student. Do this as an exercise. You have uh, two options, either to share the risk or to avoid the risk, okay? If all of us share the risk, we are better off. If some of us take on the risk and some of us says, no, 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 I don't want to take any risk, then obviously this is a defection. And then if everyone wants to avoid risk, what would happen? What would happen if, if, if everyone wants to, uh, uh, to avoid risk? The economy would collapse. There would be no economy. If everyone says, I don't want to, to take on risk. Okay. So again, stability is a public good. It's a very good example or application of uh, good theory. Now we come to another, uh, you know, uh, application of good theorem, but in a way that was not very clear before. Oliver Hart, he, he won Nobel Prize in 2016. And he tells the story that he and Sanford Grossman, this is Oliver Hart and this is Sanford Grossman, that why why do we have ownership? Why would a company uh, buy another company instead of simply writing a contract? See, many companies, they will say, okay, uh, I will simply write a contract with another company and, and do it. For example, you can have suppliers will supply you with whatever things you need. Why do you decide, no, I will do this in-house or I will buy the other company? Why would we have ownership, in other words? Why would you own a house? You cannot simply lease a house. You can have a contract that all the benefits of the house will be taken through a contract. And he tells the story that after 10 days of intensive discussions between these two economists, they came up with the answer. The answer is that contracts are incomplete 
we cannot write all the contingencies, all possible contingencies in the world. We cannot put them in writing in the contract. This is very difficult. This is, uh, in many cases, it's impossible. And because it is very difficult and in many cases impossible to write down all the contingencies, that's why you have this residual, ownership is the, is the residual control right. What, what, is, uh, what do you get after fulfilling the contract? So if the contract was complete, if you can write down all the contingencies, that means there is no residual uh, outcome or the, there is no residual control rights. All control rights has been specified uh, very clearly in the contract. You don't need something like residual rights. Khalas, it's all there in the contract if the, if the contract were complete. But if the contract were incomplete, that means there will be some right that cannot be specified in the contract. These rights will go to the owner. So that's what ownership is about. Ownership is valuable because it fills the gap in incomplete contracts. This is a very insightful result, by the way. And that's one main reason why Oliver Hart won Nobel Prize in 2016. So ownership is valuable because markets are incomplete, okay? So far, so good. Now, the next step is that the work I have done with Professor Francisco Antonio Doria, we simply connect these results. We say, okay, what is a contract? A contract is simply a code, if then, right? That's what the contract is about. If thing, this things happen, if you deliver this, I will pay you this. If I uh, pay you this, you have to do that and so on. So it's a, it's a code, it's, a, it's a, like a computer code. Now, if contracts were complete, then it will become a finite automata. That's a kind of computer codes or computer program that are limited in power, but they are complete. You can tell all the features, all the properties of these contracts up front. So if we assume the contracts are complete, that means these contracts will be a kind of finite automata which are unable to exploit all the possibilities of computable opportunities. So the market will be inefficient in the sense that there will be opportunities that cannot be translated into the code of finite automata because finite automata are limited in power. They cannot code all the, all the computable opportunities. Now, if we use a very powerful computer code, like two, they call it Turing machines. That would be good because all computable opportunities can be written, but then we cannot predict all the properties or all the, or all the outcomes of these Turing machines. So we end up with the market being incomplete. So here is the result. The market can be either efficient or complete, but not both. You cannot have a complete and efficient market at the same time, okay? This is, this is analogous theorem to Gödel's theorem. So Gödel's theorem was saying uh, a, a formal system can be either consistent or complete, but not both. Here we are saying the market can be either efficient or complete, but not both. Another direct result is that based on the work of Oliver Hart, the market can be either free or complete, but not both. So what does free mean? Free means you have private ownership. Okay, that's what free means. Free market means a market with private ownership. And you have a free market when this private ownership has positive value. And the only way or the only case in which on private ownership has value if contracts were incomplete. So either the market either free or complete. If it is complete, if the market is complete, there is no role for ownership. Ownership is out. And therefore, it will, not a free, it will not be a free market. If it were a free market in which private ownership is valuable, then it cannot be complete because ownership is valuable only if contracts were incomplete and therefore the market is incomplete. 
Now, here is an interesting idea that I hope would bring further light into the whole story. When Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand, okay, he was talking about a property that is an emergent property. Why is it invisible? Because we cannot see it. Within the market, we cannot see this property. It is only after the fact or from the outside, someone from outside the market looking at it, did, will, he will be able to see the results of this uh, coordinated self-interest resulting in the uh, uh, welfare or prosperity of everyone. So being invisible, being invisible to the market players. So this assumption that markets are efficient cannot be made inside the system or otherwise it will become visible. If you, if you put into your model the assumption that the market is efficient, if you put it into your model, then this is not an invisible hand anymore. It's visible because you are explicitly putting this assumption into your model. But if you do that, you end up with the opposite. That's, that's what Gudu's theorem is saying. If we try to put this assumption, an emergent property, if we try to internalize this emergent property and put it from within the system, we defeat the, 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 that property. This will defeat the function or the nature of that property. And we end up with the opposite, exactly the opposite. So to assume the efficiency within the model itself means that the market's hand is not invisible anymore. So let me, uh, let me uh, come to a conclusion. I hope uh, I did not take too much of your time. First of all, markets have limits. Now this state, we have to be careful. We are not saying markets are bad, okay? No, markets are good, but they have limits. And these limits are, are insurmountable. We cannot overcome these. We cannot come to a, a, a stage in which market will solve all the problem. This is not true. And this is proven by Gudu's theorem. So no one can argue about this. This is a mathematical theorem. And all mathematic, mathematics agree, by the way, on Gudu's theorem. So it will not be possible to overcome the limits of the market. These limits are impossible to remove. Yes, the market could expand. Yes, it could grow. There will be always room for innovation. There's no issue about this. But these limits will always be there. The bigger the market, the bigger the limit, okay? That means if there are limits to the market, in order to achieve Pareto optimality, in many cases, we have to resort to non-market institutions, non-profit institutions. So we need to balance for-profit institutions with non-profit or not-for-profit institutions. We cannot rely on the market alone. We cannot rely on non-profit organizations alone. We have to have both. Both have to be working in harmony in order to achieve the Pareto optimality. So this is the, and that's what Islamic economics is about. The main feature of Islamic economics is that we are balancing for-profit and non-profit domains. That's, that's, that's the basic message of Islamic economics. We also talk, okay, so now, Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand, but one hand cannot clap, right? You have to have two hands, right? You have to have two invisible hands. So one invisible hand is the self-interest. The other invisible hand is the moral sense. So caring about others will bring in the good for everyone. So we have to have two hands, not one hand. Self-interest and moral sense are, uh, uh, should be working in harmony. And by the way, Adam Smith himself, he wrote another book about moral sentiments. And he was himself a very generous person who donated most of his wealth to the poor and to the needy. So Adam Smith was not a capitalist person, was not selfish mm -hmm. at all. He was a very good person, very good mannered uh, intellectual. Uh, and he donated, as I said, most of his wealth 
was uh, given to the poor and the needies and charities. So, so this is, these are the most important things that we are looking at. Now, Islamic economics, as we said, emphasizes the balance between market and non-market mechanism. Islamic finance emphasizes ownership. As we said, ownership is valuable in an incomplete world, right? In a complex world, ownership will be valuable because you cannot write everything into a contract. We cannot live on debt. Debt means that everything you can write it down and keep uh, everything the same. No, ownership is valuable because there are many things we cannot write into the contract. For the same reason, risk sharing is very important because we cannot write all the kinds of risk and say, okay, I'm gonna sell this risk, I'm gonna buy this risk. We cannot do this. Contracts are incomplete. We will not be able to specify all the kinds of risk that we're gonna face. And that's why risk sharing will be a paradigm that will help us jointly to overcome uh, challenges related to, to risk. Global crises now require an, a new framework. We have to have a framework to manage cooperation and competition at the same time. And I hope I provided at least a few hints on this new framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Swalem, for your thought-provoking and very insightful presentation um, about uh, the economy uh, and how uh, he start with uh, Dr. Al Swalem start with uh, a point about uh, Godel's theorem, and then uh, he emphasized. Um, the th uh, theorem uh, made by Gödel's, which is a, a formal rich, uh, formal system, rich arithmetic can be either consistent or complete, but not both. And then he uh, provide argument for these points uh, about the inc incompleteness of the markets, and then uh, with some example about the tragedy of the commons, uh, and also uh, prisoners dilemma, the COVID dilemma, and then also the paradox of rationality. And finally, he comes to emphasize the need for us to uh, see the limits of the market. And then because of that, uh, he emphasized the need for us not only to rely on uh, market itself, but also to something else. And he emphasized the need for, the sec uh, for a second invisible hand, not only for uh, self-interest, but also uh, something that is based on morality. And with that argument, with those arguments, he says, uh, he, 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 he proposed the need to have Islamic economics. Uh, okay, um, friends and colleagues, uh, students, um, I think it is time for you to try to understand further about the topic we are discussing today. Um, so if you have any question, any comments, please uh, raise your hand. Um, please feel free. I will give you the chance uh, to speak directly to uh, Dr. Al Swalem. That's Muhammad Arif and Anisa Akbar. Okay. Please, Muhammad Arif. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. Thank you, sir. Um, so. Uh, basically, I heard that you mentioned earlier that we need a uh, moral sense in order to be able to um, complete the invisible hand and the explanation about um, Adam Smith. So what I wanted to ask about morality is since morality nowadays is uh, very much shaped by the utilitarian view, uh, such as the one um, brought about by John Stuart Mill. So even though Mill added the fact that we can't inflict harm uh, in our strive to maximize utility, but there's still a subjectivity of good and bad in this view, which means that we can't really define what would be, if we're talking about the context of economics, we can't define what is harmful, what is a harmful transaction or what is a genuinely good transaction. So my question is, do you think that, um, since we're talking about Islamic economics, do you think that we should enforce an objective moralist thinking in our study of economics, such as um, basically studying economics in the view of the Quran and Sunnah? And do you think that this could uh, solve some of the problems that we have in neoclassical economics today? Thank you. Very good question, I think. Uh, 
uh, and I will directly give the uh, forum. I will pass over the question to Dr. Alswaila. Thank you, Brother Arif, for the question. Actually, that was, I was planning to put this into the lecture, but I thought the lecture was going to be too long. So I thought maybe I should focus on that. So that's a good question. Is there, are there objective moral rules? I think the answer is yes. And here is one rule, okay, that all faiths agree on. Do you know what this rule is? What is one moral rule all cultures agree on? Uh, wait, oh, am I supposed to answer that? Uh, I think that we're not supposed to do bad. So I think if it's going cross culture in the context of economics, maybe we're not allowed to do usury, maybe, as an example. Well, usury is, is quite, uh, you know, uh, many faiths stand against usury. But here is, here is this, the golden rule. Do you know what is the golden rule? I'm not quite sure. Love for your neighbor, what you love for yourself. That's the golden rule. The golden rule is practically universal. All cultures agree. And it makes perfect sense, right? Because me and you are human beings. There's no reason why you should have advantages over me or me having advantage over you. So I should treat you the way I should treat myself in principle. Now, this rule is not, uh, is, is, although it makes perfect sense, it's not always trivial how to apply this rule. It requires a lot of analysis, but it is objective. In many cases, the rule will be objective. And if we apply the rule to the present dilemma game, we are able to resolve the game. There is no dilemma anymore. So if, if the two players uh, enhance their strategies, not looking only at dominant strategy, but also they look at the golden rule, they will be able to resolve the dilemma. So there are objective moral rules, and these moral rules could be uh, 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 systematized mm -hmm. and applied across, uh, across the board. That doesn't mean there will be no subjective decision. No, there will be always sub even Even in, in, in new classical economics, when you come to policy decisions, it is uh, affected by subjective choices. So we cannot eliminate the subjective component. But at least the golden rule will provide uh, uh, and it is, and this golden rule is very consistent with complexity. Why? Because you look at locally, you act locally, but the impact is global, right? So th basically this is the other hand, this is the other invisible hand, which is looking at your, uh, love you for your neighbor, for your friend, for your roommate, for your classmate, what you love for yourself, if, we, if everyone applies this, so you apply it to your neighbors, each one of your neighbors apply it to his neighbors and so on. So this will spread across the society and therefore the result will be global, even though the action is only local. So I don't have to run everywhere in the society and look for everyone in the society. It will be too much for me, but I can look after my neighbors. Each one of my neighbors will look after his own neighbors and that will solve the problem. So it's not only an objective rule, but also it is a very practical rule and very consistent with complexity where you have uh, simple rules making global impact. Thank you very much for your answer, Dr. Uh, next question, please, if any. Um, Anissa, yeah. So thank you so much for your presentation. I found it highly insightful. I actually have two questions for you. So the first is, could you tell us the past policies that you think were able to optimize or in other words, balance self-interest and group, group interest to a substantial extent as a means of maximizing efficiency? And my second question is looking at economics in retrospect, do you think that such policies are usually implemented by countries whose culture is predominantly centralized on collectivism rather than individualism? 
Okay, so let's go again to the first question. Can you elaborate further on the first question, please? Um, so my, que my first question is, could you tell us of past policies that you think were able to optimize or in other words, balance self-interest self and group interest to a substantial extent as a means of maximizing efficiency? Anisa, could you please talk a little bit slower? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Do you, could, should I repeat the question one more time? Yes, slower, but in, in slow mode. Okay, so could you tell us of past policies that you think were able to optimize, or in other words, balance self-interest and group interest to a substantial extent as a means of maximizing efficiency? Yeah, policy in okay. the past. Yeah. Okay, so to balance the group interest and self-interest, we have to uh, resort to non-selfish rules like the golden rule. See, that's, that's where we... Uh, invite morality, social values, uh, cultural values, and so on. So this just say that we cannot rely only on self-interest. We have to augment the set of strategies to include uh, these non-market institutions that would balance the system. Is, does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I if I. Uh, Yeah, perhaps Dr. Uh, Alswellen, you uh, you could uh, could you please uh, give a, a, a concrete example of uh, any policy in the past? Okay, that... healthcare. Take healthcare. Okay, take two examples. You take Canada and take the U.S. Um, I don't know if you are following the news, but this is now public uh, domain, public information. Okay, how much it costs an injection of insulin in Canada? and how much it costs in the US. It costs about $300 in the US, but it costs about, uh, I think, $13 or something like this uh, in Canada. Why? Because healthcare system in Canada is basically a co collective or social system. Everyone is contributing. While in the US, it's commercial, it's driven by profits. So from profit point of view, you want to make the insulin price as high as possible. Why? Because insurance, because you are selling to insurance companies and you want to get the maximum you can get out of those insurance companies. And who will be able to benefit from insurance companies? Only the rich who can pay the premiums, right? The poor will not be able to pay the insurance premiums and therefore they'll be excluded from the system. Now, in the context of the pandemic, we cannot exclude some people because if you exclude some people from the treatment or from the vaccine, they will infect the rest of the society. All of us have to be vaccinated or otherwise we are all facing the risk. We are all, face, we are all in the same boat. So these public goods, so uh, a concrete example, there are many concrete examples about public goods, healthcare. Let's take, for example, the climate crisis. This uh, Paris Agreement that all those uh, industrial countries, they come together to agree to cut down emission of carbon dioxide. This is a collective decision. This is not self-interest. They come together and they agree, look, we have to cooperate on this. Otherwise, if it is by self-interest, each country on its own. So this Paris Agreement is another example of a collective agreement that would curb or to resolve this dilemma, right? So this climate crisis is a dilemma, social dilemma, and these international organizations are trying to resolve this dilemma. It comes through cooperation, through uh, 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 social pressure, through uh, negotiations and so on. So it's everywhere. I mean, I, when I listed the public goods, uh, uh, the central bank, why should there be a central bank? The central bank, by the way, is a public institution. It's not a for-profit institution. This institution cares about the financial system, about the banking system. It doesn't care, it's not a for-profit entity. So all these institutions, non-profit institutions, are ways and means to overcome these dilemmas. 
Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, Anissa, we can go to the next question. That is your second question. Uh, so my second question is, looking at e economics in retrospect, do you think that such policies are usually implemented by countries whose culture is predominantly centralized on collectivism rather than individualism? Uh, so you are saying these policies are implemented by countries dominated by communism, for example? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, not communism, collectivism, like the... Hofstede's um, cultural dimensions, not communism. So, yes, as I mentioned. I mean, like similar, similar, but like. Uh, yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. So let's say uh, the Nordic countries, right? Like Sweden, like uh, uh, Finland, Finland, Canada, all these countries, they have social arrangements, like social security, very strong social security system, right? And these systems are very important in stabilizing the market, so and stabilizing the economy in general. So yes, these countries they do apply these policies. Does that uh, did I get your question or? Uh, but these countries, these countries, they do have markets. So it's not that they they overcome the market all the time. They do have efficient, effective market. They have good markets, but at the same time, in parallel, they have these social policies or collective policies that would uh, uh, balance this, the, the economy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, okay. Thank uh, Dr. Alswalem. Okay. Thank you, Anissa. Okay. Next question, if any. Uh, any comments? Actually, you need not to uh, raise a question. If you can raise any comment, if you want. Anyone? There are uh, Nicholas and Alexandra Isabel. Okay, Nicholas, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. And it is a very good presentation. I'm really impressed. And I have a question regarding the moral, uh, objective moral sense. Uh, what do you think the first step for uh, many countries all over the world to become closer to uh, adapting the second invisible hand that you have mentioned before? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, that's a good question because we really have to start from school teaching uh, children and students how to apply the golden rule. It's very difficult uh, if we don't train the kids and if we don't train ourselves, putting ourselves in the shoes of the other guy it will be very difficult to understand why the other guy is behaving in this manner. So the only way that we can get into closer to understanding each other is that if I know how does he think or how does she think? Okay, so this is very important, but we are not practicing this uh, in a very consistent manner or systematic manner. By the way, Islamic finance or Islamic economics forces us to, uh, to think in this manner. Why? Because if you look at the rules of Sharia about prohibiting gambling or prohibiting usury or this and that, you come up with a conclusion that the contract must be win-win. And the only way that you can see whether this contract is win-win or not is that you have to put yourself first in the shoes of the buyer, then in the shoes of the seller, and then come back and be sure that actually the contract is satisfying the two parties. Now, the mainstream economics, they, they think they, they satisfy this criteria, but they satisfy it only ex ante, which means they, they satisfy it only on paper. Ex post, the actual final result is not part of the, of, 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 the, of the problem. They don't care what's the final result. They only care about ex ante or before uh, uh, taking the decision. After that, they don't care about it. And that's, that's one uh, reason why these res the results of applying these uh, rigid rules of nuclear economics tend to be self-defeating because they don't balance ex ante and ex post. 
So you can look at it as four dimensions, okay? You have two parties, you have to be sure each party is, is, is satisfied and you have before and after, okay? So you have space dimension, which is about the two parties of the contract and time dimension before signing the contract and after the contract. So you have to balance all these dimensions. From space dimension, the two parties have to be satisfied. Time dimension, you have to be sure, they call it time consistency, that what you expect at the time of signing the contract should be at least most of the time consistent of what you actually get, right? So what you see is what you get. That, that, should, that should be the norm, rather than you just do whatever you do and then you never know what's gonna happen uh, after the fact. So we need to balance space and time at the same time. And uh, I think that's, so if we, if we go back to the, how to spread the culture of, of moral sense, it's not difficult, but I don't think it's very difficult, but it is, it's not trivial. It is not very simple, but it is not very difficult. Starting with the schools, learning how to uh, play the roles of each other. So I would say, what would Nicholas think about this? So I have to read about Nicholas, what, what his background and what is his preferences. And then from his perspective, I say, okay, from his perspective, that's what he sees. And Nicholas has to read about Sammy, what he thinks, his background. And then, and then we come to agreement. That's the point. That's to say, okay, from your point of view, you should be looking for this. From my point of view, I should be looking for this. And there is a room for agreement that each one would be better off from uh, our each of us own perspective. Thank you, Dr. Alswalem. Thank you, Nicholas. But Dr. Alswalem, before I, I continue with other students, um, what is said uh, to follow your discussion? What is said with me and other uh, lect economics lecturer uh, are that we are supposed to tell students that uh, you are uh, that people are self-interested uh, and. If uh, as people are self-interested, uh, then perhaps your response is by doing the same things rather than trusting the people and love them as if you love yourself. So what do you think about this? Yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, teaching people that you should be looking for your own self is actually damaging. And there are many studies that show students in economic major are more selfish than students in sociology, for example, or science or other <laughs> majors. So people, uh, people react to what you teach them. If you tell them self-interest, no. It's, I mean, we should balance self-interest with group interest. That's, that's the problem. Uh, we have to understand that we have to understand each other. Okay, fine. Self-interest, but I should understand self-interest. So if we are able to, to change, that's why we need a new framework. That's why we should change the way mainstream economics now is done by emphasizing this uh, uh, mutual. So I think that's, that's the way teaching people self-interest is damaging actually. So we should start from understanding each other and the golden rule. And from there, by the way, that's, but this is another topic. We can derive all the rules of Islamic finance from the golden rule. But I will not address this. I'll keep it for a future occasion, okay? All the rules regarding usury, regarding gambling, regarding zakat, we can derive these uh, uh, rules from the golden rule. The golden rule is a master rule, as a master framework that could be, uh, uh, could, could encompass all the detailed rules of a healthy uh, economic system. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we go to um, Alexandra Isabel. Alexandra Isabel Nugroho. Alexandra. Okay. 
Thank you yeah, very please. much for the opportunity. And first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sammy for a very insightful presentation. I want to ask regarding that to invisible hand. Uh, I think that right now the government is having a dilemma between healthcare and well-being of its people, but also keeping up the economic condition so there will not happen a recession. Uh, I want to ask from your perspective, is there any way uh, or any strategy that the government could make uh, using the two invisible hand, also the golden rule to balance between the helping of people, but also the economic condition of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a good uh, question. That's a very important point. Uh, people used to think that the market is decentralized, but the non-market is centralized. But that's not, uh, doesn't have to be the case. So we could also have a decentralized nonprofit system. So we say each region or each city will have its own uh, uh, healthcare, you know, uh, organizations that will take care of that city because each uh, community, they take care of each other, right? They care about each other more than other faraway communities. So. So if you decentralize, you say, okay, the government would say, look, uh, we will have, I think this is the case in Indonesia and many other countries, but this could be enhanced, that you have decentralized organizations, nonprofit organizations that would help the communities in each region to overcome the, uh, uh, the pandemic. So rather than wait for the instructions from the central government, for all matters, that will be too much. This will be, uh, it will be too slow and the incentives will not be that strong because uh, you lose the incentive to care about your community. Remember again, the golden rule. So people care about their communities. So the central government might consider having a general framework and then would delegate many of the details to decentralize, localized uh, societies or organizations or, or uh, entities that would uh, carry out these uh, policy guidelines and work uh, together with the local communities to overcome these challenges. I think, in, and this will create, um, uh, this will also create competition between different communities because once you delegate uh, the many of the responsibilities to local communities, each community will have its own incentive to be creative and innovative and beat the other communities. So you will have healthy competition. At the same time, you will have the incentives for uh, people to care about their communities. Uh, efficiency decision-making is very uh, efficient because it's local. You don't have to wait all the way to get to the top of the bureaucracy and then coming back. So the central government might consider having a general framework or general policy and then would delegate uh, the implementation to localized or decentralized uh, organization. This, this might be one way to look at it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we go to... Um Rafter Yang. Rafter. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, before that, I would like to say thank you for the great presentation, Dr. Sammy. So my question is, uh, for the social dilemma, is it really unsolvable? Uh, because I think the dominant strategies much more related to self-interest. So they choose the dominant strategies due to its efficiency and the benefit they have. So could we give bigger advantages to group interest rather than self-interest? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rafter. When we say unsolvable, we mean unsolvable based on uh, dominant strategy or based on uh, self-interest. And the word solvable means, of course, you can always do take dominant strategy and that's it. I mean, and you end up with the inferior outcome. But that's not the objective of a dominant strategy. The dominant strategy is supposed, why, why is it called dominant strategy? 
because it should give you the better outcome, right? The, the higher payoff. It is called the dominant strategy because individually, this strategy will give you the higher payoff every time you apply it. And that's why it is a dominant strategy. But then if the other player also follows the same logic in a prisoner dilemma game, we end up with an inferior outcome. The payoff will be lower. It is the payoff will not be higher, it will be actually lower. So this contradicts the function of a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is supposed to bring in Pareto optimal or Pareto superior outcomes or payoffs. But what happens in a prisoner's dilemma game, a dominant strategy will, if applied by both players, will result in a Pareto inferior. So that's, that's what unsolvable mean. Otherwise, uh, there are many ways to solve it, but unsolvable means it's that following the dominant strategy logic, we cannot get the outcome that we expect from a dominant strategy. The result of the dominant strategy is not what we are looking for in case of a prisoner dilemma game. So if you want to get to the Pareto optimal outcome, you have to play a non dominant strategy. If you play a dominant strategy, you get a Pareto inferior payoff. So there is no way you can use a dominant strategy to get a Pareto superior outcome. It's, there's no way to get that. So if we follow dominant strategy approach, we end up with a, a Pareto inferior out payoff. If we want to reach the Pareto superior payoff, we have to play non dominant strategy, uh, we have to follow uh, non-dominant strategy approach. That's why it's unsolvable. Otherwise, if we augment the game with social values, caring about others, then you are changing the game. So that's the way out. The way out is to change the game. Otherwise, the, uh, the way it is, the game will, will end up with the inferior outcome. So to change the game, that's, that's the key. The key is to change the game and to say, look, you have to care about others. What works for you works for the others. What works for others should work for you. You should care about, and so on. Once you introduce this social dimension, group interest, once you include group interest into the payoff structure, it becomes a different game. And that's, that's how, how to get out of the, of the dilemma, is to change the game. You don't keep the game. That's... The same thing in Islamic finance. If we do, if we want to apply Islamic finance, we have to change the game. We don't go to the same game of the convention finance and try to play according to the rules of the convention finance. You want to play Islamic finance. It doesn't work. You will be always losing. To play Islamic finance, you have to play your own game. You have to follow your own rules. So same thing for this dilemma. We have to change the games and changing the games means you are changing the perspective, the mindset, the rules of the game. You are changing the rules of the game and this would resolve the dilemma. Thank you, Dr. Al Swaila. So thank you so we much, the game. Dr. Sami. Yeah, yeah thank you, Dr. We changed the game. We changed the payoff structure in the society. So people will behave differently. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's move to the next question, to the next student, um, Wilma Aziza. Wilma, yeah, okay. please. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Pak Akbar. Uh, is my voice clear? Can you hear yes, me well? Yes, very clear, yes. yes. Okay, so uh, hello, Dr. Swailam. Uh, so um, from your presentation earlier is, uh, what I caught is um, the instability and uh, the complexity is good for competition. It makes um, the parties of the Islamic economics uh, for being more innovative. So we can uh, we can find new ways to to uh, to reach efficiency and make uh, make other markets and etc. Uh, uh, from 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 what I got is 
is it true that uh, are you saying the nature of complexity, the, um, in the incompatibility and paradox is a great tool to to the parties in Islamic in Islamic economies to uh, make the make the uh, Islamic economics uh, at its best. Can you elaborate on that? Thank you. Make the Islamic economics what? To be to be to be more uh, more uh, more in great capacity. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. To be better, to be better. To be better, okay. So now this complexity is the description of the world. It's the nature, it's the nature of the universe that we are living in. So whether this is good or bad, that's a different story. Is gravity good or bad? That's I mean, that's something, it's nature. Gravity is a force of nature, right? So it's something part of nature. Same thing for complexity. It's not something that is it good or bad. It is that's the that's how it works. That's how the system works. And if if economics is a science, then we should. Uh, that's the positive. You see, you see the economists say you have to take the world as it is. Okay, fine. To take the world as it is, we have to admit that the world is complex, which means the parts and the whole in many cases, frequently they are different. We cannot assume that they are the same. So in, within this framework, we have to look at uh, all these aspects that we have discussed. And this would require the balance between self-interest and group interest, uh, moral sense and, and the invisible hand of the competition and self-interest. So this balance would help us live in a complex world in a better way. So the results of following the rules of Islamic economics in a complex world would be better for everyone. And honestly, it, you don't have to use mathematics to prove this. That's the, that's the world around us. Those people who care about each other, they uh, outperform those who don't care about each other. This is a fact, this is a matter of fact that, uh, as we said, in, in countries that uh, emphasize social security, social health care policies and so on, like Canada, like Sweden, like Finland and so on, those countries have better health uh, care systems, better uh, health for their citizens, than countries that they simply commercialize the healthcare system, like the US. So this is a matter of fact, it is, it's not rocket science. This is not rocket science. It is, it is a fact that we, we see daily on daily basis. Uh, so the balance between the for-profit and the non-profit is something very essential uh, for all economies. Now, what is unique about Islamic economics is that Islamic economics will tell us where to draw the line, right? For example, you, could, you can make profit, but there are things that you cannot make profit of, like a, like loan. We cannot make profits out of a, of a loan. A loan has to be a non-profit transaction. It has to be charity. Charity is, is a duty that everyone has to, to, to donate, to pay the cat, and so on. So Islamic economics will give us uh, a clear line between the domains of the for-profit and the non-profit so that no one domain will dominate the other. See, capitalism, they said everything can be sold through the market. So the market, the for-profit domain became so big and everything can be converted into a market transaction in this framework and everything would become for sale, which is, which is obviously, that's what the result what we see. Communist countries, they said, no, market is bad. Everything has to be done cooperatively through charity. And um, this will, have, will solve all the problems. It turns out it didn't solve all the problems. So that means we have to balance these two domains. And we have to, and in order to balance the domains, we have to know exactly where to draw the line between the two domains. 
There are things that we cannot make profit out of. And there are things that we have to go to the market. When, when, when a young man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, give me from the zakat. People were paying zakat and this zakat was collected and given to the Prophet وسلم. So he has uh, in the storage, he has so much you know, food and gold and so on. So this young man said, why should I work hard? I should just go and get zakat. This zakat is for whom? So let me get zakat. So the Prophet وسلم, told him, if you, if you insist, I will give you, but zakah is not permitted to be given to qawiyyim muktasil. La hadda fiha li qawiyyim muktasil. A person who is able to earn his income is not entitled to get zakah. He has to go to the market. He has to earn his income. So the market is obligatory in Islamic economics, right? So... We have to, we must have the market. The market is important, but we have to complement the market with social values. I Thank hope, you. I hope this will help. Okay. Thank you, Wilma. Um, okay, Dr. Uh, al Suhailam, you actually, you, you already mentioned, uh, you already answered Wilma's question, but I, if I'm allowed to, uh, but permit me to uh, elaborate further Wilma's question. Uh, I think the question is something like this. Okay, when you say that what we want is to change the structure of the game or the payoff structure in the game uh, so that people will behave in a, uh, in a better way. Um, but now the question is how to make sure that Islamic economics will bring about that better game? And how to make sure that Islamic economics will not bring us to another problems in our economy? Uh, actually, you already mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, the, the zakah, that the zakah should not be given to someone who is able to work. Uh, because it will change the incentive for him to work, for example. But could you please elaborate further this, this, this idea? Yes, uh, Islamic economics is, uh, is not trivial. It is not, we are not saying this is a recipe. If you follow the recipe, you will get the results. No, it's, <laughs> it's not a recipe. It is, it is an investment that there is risk associated with this investment, but this risk is, is minimum. So there will be problems associated with, just like any policy, any economic policy, it doesn't have to be Islamic. Any economic policy, no matter what, whether on the right, on the left, on the center, it doesn't matter. Any economic policy will create its own challenges, right? So the same thing applies to Islamic economics. If we apply the principles of Islamic economics, we will have challenges. But these challenges are of lesser magnitude than the original problems that we were able to avoid using these, for example, let, let me give an example, risk sharing. Without trading debt, we could have avoided the global financial crisis. Without refinancing, we could have avoided the global financial crisis, right? But then there will be issues related to risk sharing. We have to solve this is these issues. Risk sharing is not trouble free, no, there is no, there's nothing trouble free in this world, by the way. We are, there will be always issues and challenges. And since the title of, uh, or the theme of the conference is about digital transformation, digital technologies could help a lot in solving these problems related to asymmetric information, related to decentralization and so on and so forth. So uh, just like a vaccine, okay? The vaccine would help us overcome the pandemic but that doesn't mean the vaccine doesn't create some side effect. There could be some side effects of the vaccine, but these side effects are much, the likelihood of these side effects are much, much less than the likelihood of uh, the side effects of the pandemic or being infected by the pandemic. So it's, it's, a, it's a journey, okay? Islamic economics is a journey. It's not just push a button and all of a sudden we are there. No, it's not like that. You have to keep working and keep going, but every time we will be able to avoid bigger problems, but then only to face smaller problems. But there will be always problems. We'll never be have we'll never have zero problem. We'll never have zero problem. Thank 
Thank you very much for your answer, uh, Dr. Alswail. But uh, Dr. Alswail, I think most of the students here are relatively new to Islamic economics. Um, even though some uh, perhaps uh, already read some books uh, in Islamic economics, but mostly are uh, new to Islamic economics. So could you please tell us where we are now in terms of the journey that you have just mentioned? So where Islamic economics journey has been and what has been achieved and what has not been achieved and what, where will it go in the future? <laughs> Something like that. 40 years ago, okay, 40 years ago, people were questioning, is there anything like Islamic economics? What does it mean? Okay, now people say, yes, there is something called Islamic economics, but then how to really implement it in the best manner? How about Islamic economic institution? We have Zakat institutions, we have Islamic banks, we have Takaful organizations, we have investment funds, Sharia compliant investment funds, and so on. Are these enough? No, they are not enough. We have to keep building more institutions, more organizations, in order to implement the principles of Islamic economics. So Islamic economics is a, a coherent framework. And just let me just let me emphasize this point, by the way. The basic principles of Islamic Islamic economics are universal. We are not uh, alone in this world, okay? We care about poverty, but we are not the only people who care about poverty. Everyone else is, many people around the globe, they worry about poverty and they work hard to, to overcome poverty. But Islamic economics provide us with more incentives and more rich tools to overcome the poverty. So. We are all, uh, we, we share the value, these universal, these are universal values. Fighting poverty, helping the poor, helping the needy, uh, avoiding accumulation of debt. Everyone knows that too much debt is dangerous. This is something everyone agrees about, okay? So when we say usury is prohibited, what is usury? What is interest? Interest basically is a mechanism for debt to self-multiply just like a virus that would self-multiply without any limits that would ultimately would destroy the economy. So we have to put controls over how much debt is created and how it is created. Islamic finance would say debt has to be created alongside with wealth. So debt creation and wealth creation, they go hand in hand. They, they are not divergent like in an interest-based system. In an interest-based system, these are two separate processes. Wealth creation, debt creation are two separate processes. And obviously debt creation is much easier, much faster than wealth creation. And therefore debt will overcome and overtake the, the, the wealth and you end up with a crash. And therefore, this, and that's why the system is unstable. So all the basic principles are common sense and are shared by the majority of cultures and faiths around the globe. Gambling is bad in almost all cultures. Very few cultures. Yes, there are, there, you will find casinos in many places around the globe. This is true. But the cultures in which these casinos are built, they don't like gambling. Just like alcohol. The vast majority of people, they, they think alcohol is not something very good even though it's, it's widespread across cultures. So the basic values that we have are actually universal, okay? So we should understand this. When we say Islamic economics, we are not talking about something uh, only Muslims care about. We have common uh, values with, with many people around the globe and we have to cooperate with them. And when we look at the component of the Islamic economic system, these components are already there. Equities, for example, leasing, for example, uh, cooperative societies, uh, charities, all these are already there. We are not building something completely new. We are trying to uh, uh, take the best part of the economic system and avoid the worst part. So that's what Islamic economics is. It's a strategy that we, okay, we take the best components of the uh, uh, mainstream economic system 
and avoid the worst part. It is not that we're going to build completely new. No, we're going to build on what is already there. We, we benefit from what is already there. We share the passion for helping the needy and the poor. We share this passion with, with people around the globe. It's not something only to Muslims, no. So, so Islamic economics is a framework that should bring people together, not separate Muslims from non-Muslims. No, that's, I don't think that's the way out. So, so there are already achievements. However, the, the concept of Islamic economics has now is, I'm not saying it's mature enough. There is still a lot of work to be done. There are still many institutions have to be developed. Existing institutions have to be improved, but there are already improvement. There are in terms of research, in terms of knowledge, and in terms of practical institutions on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, okay, as uh, we are uh, approaching uh, three, o'clock and uh, so we are uh, I think you are hungry right for for lunch <laughs> 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 okay um, if anyone if any question for, for if any students want to raise question for the last one uh, for the last chance if any or you can give your comment actually you need not to ask uh, to raise a question if any anyone <laughs> no okay If no more uh, student uh, to raise uh, a question, then uh, Dr. Al Suelem, I think we can. I think you can uh, come to your closing statement um, about what we have discussed uh, this afternoon, and also perhaps you can have some words for the students uh, about what they perhaps something something uh, that can be useful for them in the future. Thank you very much, Akbar. Thanks to the uh, all the student participants. Very interesting questions. Uh, very uh, enlightening discussions. And in my opinion, there is a very good opportunity that we could do something useful to the world. Always keep in mind, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ. The Prophet ﷺ was sent only as a mercy for all worlds, not for only the Muslim world, no, it's for everyone. So keep this in mind that our objective is to help humanity. So it is not only about how to design a Sharia compliant solution only for Muslims. You have to keep in mind that we want to help humanity at large. Remember that the, 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 the two scientists who developed Pfizer are two Muslim scientists and they help the whole humanity. So keep this in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Al Suelem. Um, friends, colleagues, students, um, we are happy uh, that we have listened to uh, an insightful lecture this uh, afternoon. And we thanks to our speaker, Dr. Shami Al Suelem, and please give applause to him. Thank, Thank you. you very much once Thank again. You. Okay, uh, everyone, once again, let's uh, uh, thanks uh, our speaker, Dr. Sami al -Swailams. And hopefully uh, everyone uh, are, everyone is blessed uh, with health, good health and happiness. And see you in the next sections, in, in the next sessions. See you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Sami. Very inspiring speech. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.